7, Luke chapter 7, uh, that song, just a great song. I, the book of Ephesians this morning at Sunday School was, was incredibly helpful to me on, on a few things um, for, for a number of reasons. One of them is the, the fact that God loves us. Now, there, there's no question I, I, I knew that God loves us before this morning, but just seeing, seeing the, um, the way that, that the book of Ephesians describes it, I want you to notice what it says in Ephesians while you're turning to Luke 7. I just want to read you Ephesians chapter number uh, 3, verse 14. It says, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. He's praying this prayer request for the Ephesians, for the Gentiles there in Ephesus, to, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. So he's talking about this desire for the might and strength in the inner man. This is spiritual strength, not just something that he's going to assist you, but that he would do this. He would, give, he would be the source of that strength. But notice what he tells us there, that, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love. Now, we have a skewed perspective on love. It's just a very messed up perspective on love. We have allowed love to be interpreted to us by Hollywood and by romance novels and all sorts of stuff. And when reality, God tells us what he does is that he loves us, that he reached down and grabbed us from the mire and the filth, the sin that we once were in, what you once were. He saved us from that. He's saying, I want you to be established in that love. Now, here's the, here's the significance of that love. Um, he says that, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love. The dwelling of Christ in, in love, in fact, the dwelling, the, the, the filling of him in you, the Bible's going to describe uh, in the in coming chapters about, uh, about the Holy Spirit's filling, is found there within love. And, and to make that further case, he says that, ye, that may, I'm sorry, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Notice what he said there. You are filled with all the fullness of God as you comprehend the love of God. That's a powerful statement because there's a lot of things in the Bible that God wants you to know about him. But he says the fullness of God is going to be known and it's going to be enjoyed by you the more that you comprehend the fullness of how much God loves you. It's powerful. And so how, how, do we, how are we going to have the fullness of God in this? It's based on his love. That's the knowledge that he wants you to be full of so that way you can grow in him. And so that passage, uh, when we sing songs like that one, when we sang uh, early, two songs, well, I guess not that last song, but the song before, No One Ever Cared For Me Like Jesus. No, actually, that was the last one. Uh, does Jesus care? Does Jesus care? Th those concepts, yes, he does. He, he cared enough to save you. He cared enough to listen to your prayers. Uh, when we make mistakes, when we try and fail, it's one of the verses on um, the two songs previous, that he cares. He cares when it seems like he can't. And the point is he wants you to comprehend that, how much he loves you. And uh, anyway, so there's going to be much on that. So now you're in the book of Luke. Luke's going to be a similar um, mindset as far as what he's teaching us. I, I want you, while you're in the book of Luke, um, go ahead and put your finger there and go over to Matthew chapter number 11 just for a moment because I want you to see some context. Um, the book of Luke doesn't reference what happened here, but what we do find is chapter number 6, he addressed the... Uh, the, the message, the context of the Sermon on the Mount. But then in chapter 7, he goes on, we have the miracles that he does in regards to the centurion and the, the healing of his, of his sick servant. Uh, the, right after that, um, it, it describes that, um, that there was a, uh, another, uh, another one that was shown great mercy, the, this woman who had a dead son who brought back to life, so power over sickness and death. And, uh, and anyways... With what's going on in those areas, Luke, or, sorry, Matthew chapter number 11 tells us what happens. So it actually fills in a spot that it doesn't tell us in the book of Luke. So uh, Matthew chapter 11, verse number 20. So based on that, he's doing all these miracles like bringing people back to life. That's a pretty big miracle. Would you agree? Yeah, I kind of want to see that. I think that would be pretty amazing. But he did it. And so these gigantic miracles, look what it says in verse number 20. Then began, then began he to upbraid the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done, because they repented not. Woe unto thee, Chorazin, woe unto thee, Bethsaida, for if, thy mighty, for if the mighty works which were done in you had been in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say unto you, it shall be more toler tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you." 
Now, Tyre and Sidon, does anybody remember some notable characters that come? We have, for instance, if you go to uh, Wikipedia and you look up your hometown, sometimes it'll, you'll go down and it's going to tell you notable people from your hometown. And uh, my hometown of 60,000, actually 80,000 people, Manteca, California, has three notable people, and I can't remember any of them. But we, we have uh, three notable people, at least somebody claimed, and uh, maybe, maybe a fourth one added by now, I don't know. But uh, no doubt Indianapolis has its list. But if you think of the notable people from Tyre and Sidon, anybody have any, any uh, notable, what's that? Jezebel, what a popular lady. All right, now uh, with Jezebel, that wicked woman Jezebel, in fact, the Bible describes her as that wicked woman. Uh, when, when God says that wicked woman, we should pay attention. She is a wicked woman. And uh, by the way, when it says that, that phrase, that wicked woman, we're going to see a title similar to that with this lady we're going to see here in, in Luke 7. But, uh, but anyways, she's from there. But the more important part actually has to do more with her name, um, having an expression having to do with kind of like royalty in Baal worship, if we can kind of just draw some, some, um, some application for that, that she is a princess of those things, of worship to Baal. And uh, anyways, because this is a seat of Baal worship, much of Baal worship, this is kind of centered around there. This is where they're making the idols for Baal right there in Tyre and Sidon. It's a wicked area, wicked, wicked area. And God said it's more tolerable for, for them because Jesus was doing works in areas that are claiming to be expecting him and they reject him. He is preaching to them the necessity that he is, in fact, the Messiah, but they refuse. They refuse to accept that they would not turn to the belief on him. And so he says it, it's going to be, they, they would have. If I had gone there, they would have. Look at uh, verse number 23. And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which had been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. In other words, if I had done these things, these miracles in Sodom and Gomorrah, or in Sodom, Sodom wouldn't have been wiped off the face of the earth. They wouldn't have had that rain of fire that came down and destroyed it. Uh, verse 24, by saying to you, that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom the day of judgment than for thee. And by the way, Capernaum was wiped out uh, some 40 years after this just the wickedness that took place there by rejecting Christ to his face. Just terrible, terrible things that took place. So anyways, in, in that. So this, this gives you a little bit of context. So Jesus is doing all these things. He's preaching these things. And I'll be honest, there, this, as far as uh, ministry goes, I don't get incredibly discouraged. I hear pastors talk about the Monday blues. That's, that's like a, this, I guess a big thing for pastors that after you preach Sunday, you get to show up on Monday. And Monday you're discouraged because of how Sunday went. I don't get that way. I really don't. I, I love Sunday. I love being around God's people. I, I'm energized on, on Mondays. Now, normally we'll stay up late on Sunday night, and so I don't. I sleep in. Monday, I generally always sleep in, but sleeping in still looks like 7.30, so it's not, it's not incredibly late. But I, I at least don't. Uh, the, the alarm wakes me up on, on Mondays, generally. Um, so with that, uh, waking up at, at a time that allows me to just get a little bit of extra rest, and I'll kind of go slowly, take my time in the things that I'm doing, um, I'm not worn, I'm not like, I have no blues on, on Mondays. It's not a big deal because we got to go to church and we love it. We really enjoy going to church. We love going to church with you guys and being with you guys. That's a highlight for our week. So if that's the case, uh, I understand a lot of people do get discouraged. And there have been times where I have been discouraged, times where I just preach my heart out. And it's like nobody listens. Now, generally, you guys do a really, really good job. And I can't think of a time where I've been here where people just didn't listen. But I have preached at a lot of places before, <laughs> and uh, there's been times where I just I'd rather go to the dentist. I mean, honestly, like where where people just it's like don't care time. They're checking their watches. They're sitting there impatient and just like you can hear nothing. It's just like it's silence except for my voice. And so it, it's it's generally I, I love it when people respond and, and people are listening. And you can watch people. And as preachers, we watch people. But so, sometimes it's discouraging to preach and you prepare a message and nobody wants to listen. Now Jesus. I don't think it was discouraged in the same way that, that perhaps I would get discouraged or maybe a Sunday school teacher that delivers a message or a lesson that, that is not received as well. But Jesus has been preaching, and he just gave the, the, the message that describes his kingdom, and, and this is really the pinnacle of his career, in regard, if I can call it a career. And I, I don't want to minimize the ministry of Jesus to a career, but, but the point is this, is this is incredible teaching that takes place here. And, uh, and he's doing miracles, miracles that should just wow us to the point, well, this has to be the Messiah. This has to be the Christ. And, and people are like, eh, I don't want it. So they don't listen to what he says. When you get to Luke chapter number 7, it gives us a little glimpse into that when he tells us in, uh, in verse number, uh, verse number um, 
something. I forgot where I was going to be at on this one. I apologize. Uh, I'm going to tell you in just a moment. Okay, so um, in verse number, well, I'm trying to think where I want to start. Verse, thir verse 30, uh, but the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized of him. And the Lord said, Whereunto then shall I liken the men of this generation, and to what are they like? They are like unto children sitting in the marketplace and calling one to another, saying, We have piped unto you, and ye have not danced, and we have mourned, we have mourned to you, and ye have not, we have not wept like children. Verse 33, For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and ye say, He hath the devil. The son of man is come eating and drinking, and ye say, Behold, a gluttonous man and a wine-bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. But wisdom is justified of all her children. Well, here's what he tells them. He said, John the Baptist came, and he didn't come eating, he didn't come eating and drinking. The idea of, of drinking wine is not like he wasn't sipping on you know, alcohol. The, the concept here is these would, these, he wasn't drinking um, like good drinks. Like For instance, if you go home, hopefully there's no alcohol in your fridge, but when you go to your home, you may have juice in your fridge. And so juice is a luxury. Do you need to have juice? No, I like drinking juice. In fact, uh, yesterday I, I did some work outside. And it was really hot. How many of you would test? It was hot. It was hot outside. And I had to mow, and, and my lawnmower had died, like, on Monday. Well, it didn't die. Just, it ran out of gas, which, uh, you know, it, for me to get in my car and drive to the gas station is all about 30 seconds. And so it took me from Monday until Saturday to actually go do that. And so uh, I had finished one side of my front yard and half my, uh, the other side of my front yard, I had half of it done. And so I was that neighbor. And so anyways, I finally did it, but boy, it was hot. And I would go for a while and I'd push it in my, I, I have like the self-propelled mower that um, it, it doesn't self-propel. And so I, I just push through it and, and I'm like, ah, it'll be fine. Well, Saturday motivated me. I'm fixing that thing. And uh, so finally I fixed it, and there was issues with the way it was starting because, you know, there's no oil in it. And so apparently combustible engine needs that. And so, um, so anyways, I, I ended up um, a gas combustion engine, not combustible. <laughs> Hopefully the engine's not combustible. All right, but anyways, the, um, but when, when uh, finally put the oil. So I, I got it all fixed. It's, it's working. And uh, anyways, it was just so hot out there. That, um, that I went in and I wanted to get something to drink and my wife had some peach tea and so what I did is I, I got like a, one of those packs of peach tea and, and I made a peach tea and I put ice in it and I had it waiting there for me and I came inside and it was gone. And my wife told me, if you leave it there, we have little ones that will go and take it and so I left it on the counter and it was gone. And I was so uh, under control mad at that, at that moment, if you believe that, because uh, I didn't have it so I had to drink water you know what, water was probably the better thing for me. By the way, they didn't drink it. It somehow got moved from there to the living room. So it was just sitting there. Um, and I found it like three hours later, and they hadn't drank it. So I apologize. I should apologize to my children. Although I wasn't mad in front of them. And so anyways, the, um, the, the, the point on that is the water was just fine. The water was fine. The water was good. I didn't need juice. It didn't have to, it didn't have to be juice. And so John the Baptist didn't come drinking excessive like, things. In other words, things of any luxury whatsoever. John the Baptist had no luxury he, he ate locust and wild honey. You know the thing about locust and wild honey is it takes no preparation. You literally reach in and you eat it or you grab the locust. I do wonder if it was like, like while it was still kicking and stuff like that. I had a goldfish one time and I didn't expect it, but like it was still like moving inside of me. And so I do wonder like how the locust went because that's, that's pretty big stuff. But anyways, that, no preparation. Why? Because he's all about it. And so, well, well people are like, oh, look, he, John the Baptist, he's crazy with the, he avoids all these things. And really, one that's serving God should be enjoying life. And so, um, so they bash him for that. Well, Jesus comes, and he goes to special meals, and he's invited to places to eat. And, and he drinks stuff that, that he's given that is not water, but is good stuff, stuff that's fruit of the vine. And so he's enjoying drinks that are more luxurious just water. He's eating food that takes some preparation. People are like, oh, he's a glutton, and he drinks his stuff, and boy, he's, he's just uh, self-indulgent. And so you can't win for losing with these people. You ever get that kind of stuff? And you know, People are just wanting to fight. They just want to find every reason to deny something. That's really what they've done with Jesus. And in this, what he points out, there's no winning for losing with you people. Wisdom is justified of all her children. And so what's going to be found is that wisdom will be demonstrated then the people that do believe. Now, we get to verse number 36, and look at this great honor that's going to be bestowed. And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And so, yeah, I want you to come eat at my house. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, 
which was a sinner. Which, she, I'm sorry, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment and stood at his feet behind him weeping and began to wash his feet with tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now, there are three occasions which this happens in the scriptures. The books of Matthew and Mark have one that takes place two days before the, um, the crucifixion of Jesus. Now, there's another one that's going to take place in the book of John that takes place six days before the crucifixion of Jesus, or maybe six days before the Passover, I'm not sure. This one takes place about a year and some odd months, possibly weeks before the, the crucifixion. So there are four different occasions which this takes place. All of them are, are seen with a couple of similarities. One is that there is an alabaster box. Now, based on the timing, people are like, well, how come there's discrepancies in the story? Because they're different events. That's, that's the thing. The other thing is that anointing was a very common practice. Now, how common was it? It was common enough that it's mentioned four times on three different occasions that, um, that it's taken place where people come to anoint Jesus. But the other part about it is when she does so, is this woman, this woman is going to anoint Jesus. And the way this happens is that she, he's sitting there eating. She hears about it. She goes to the Pharisee's house. Now, don't think about houses like we would have today, for instance. If somebody walks into my house, I'm eating dinner with some guests. I'm probably going to know this a little bit more, right? Wouldn't you? Somebody comes through the door, they just open up and, and come through. Uh, the Pharisee would have been probably well off because if he's regarded as a Pharisee, would require some sort of financial success as that is the demonstration of, of the benefit and the blessing of God, of being the servant of God. And, and obviously that's not scripturally mandated, but they considered it such. And so he would have been well off. And, um, and his home obviously had enough space to, to greet guests. And so more than likely, you would have had an open area where they could have come through in some area, possibly with porters and, and some access that people would have. My guess, and this is purely a guess, I didn't live back then. My, my knowledge of their histories is as much as I've read, but those contradict some. But it seems that there would be some kind of court area that would have had easy access to it. And, uh, and so anyways, you would still, you don't normally just walk into wherever you want, but you have the access to go in there. People kept their doors unlocked. Because sometimes they didn't have doors. They just had an opening you went through. It's hard to lock those doors without, without doors. And so anyways, um, they're sitting there eating. And, and the way they're eating, remember, they're not sitting. Because I got kind of confused at this for a little while when, when I was looking through. How did she they sit down to eat and then she comes behind him and, wash, and, and anoints her feet. And, and his head, by the way, because it's going to tell us that later. And, uh, but how, how's that working? Well, and then I, quick realization, they didn't have chairs, all right? They didn't have chairs. They weren't using chairs until over 1,000 years later in those regions. And so anyways, with that, they would have been sitting at a rather low table, if even a table at all. Sometimes it, it would be set right in front of them on the ground in a covered area, and they would be sitting on the ground or on pillows, and their feet would be to the side. So if you notice what would be happening, the food would be in front of them, they would be sitting down, and their feet would kind of be to the side behind them. So they weren't sitting like this because their food's right there. So they were sitting like, I mean, I'm, I can't lift up both legs to show you, but you get the idea. All right. So anyways, that's what's happening. And uh, so it makes sense that she can come up behind him with both his feet while he's sitting on the ground and she, she can anoint his feet. And by the way, that'd be dirty because it's back then. And he wasn't wearing a pair of, you know, wingtips while he was there. He was, he was, he was more likely wearing sandals. We see some, uh, some reference to sandals that are mentioned in the stories. For instance, the book of John describes sandals and, and several passages that talk about the sandals and the latchets of our shoes, uh, of their shoes back then. So more than likely he's wearing sandals. He, um, it, it, and, and anyways, with that, it's possibly even barefooted because he didn't seem to have much luxury at all. Um, he had a coat, but something that would have kept him warm, but that's pretty much it. And uh, dressed very, very simply from what we know, the tunic that's described that he would wear. He doesn't have much, so he's either wearing sandals or he's barefooted. And he shows up to this place, and he's going to eat this meal. And while they're getting ready to sit down to eat, so they come sit down, this lady shows up and anoints the feet. Now, anointing the feet, sometimes anointing seems like a really mystical term as well. For instance, I've done um, anointings with oil, the book of James talks about James chapter 5, anointing with oil. If, if someone is sick, uh, weakly or sick among you, what, what they're supposed to do, what the Bible describes there, if we're seeking this, this healing from the Lord, is to call on the elders of the church. By the way, that doesn't mean you call the pastor. This would be elders in the church. And normally if we get called, what I would do is I would take I would, me and, and a couple of you guys, uh, that would, we would go and we would anoint, we would pour oil, and we would, uh, and by the way, I do pour oil, um, 
I was asked earlier if I was, I was Catholic in the past, but I have enough Catholic in the past that I don't like to like just put a dollop of oil on the forehead there. Uh, that's too much like baptism, <laughs> that kind of baptism. And so we would pour the oil, and I do, and I have this little, this little cruise of oil. It's a it's a rose of Sharon oil. Por- apparently, it was is really good, but. Um, most importantly is it's accessible and so that's what I have and uh, anyways it's not a special kind of oil it's not magical healing but it represents something the anointing that would take place uh, they would lay hands the the prayer of faith will heal the sick so it is faith it's not like the oil has some magical property to it so the, the point on is is this anointing it was not so much that like there was some kind of special ceremony that was going on as much as the covering, the, some, something that was going on there, a lot of times that would have to do with a, 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 medicine, a medicinal purpose or a cleansing purpose that was applied there. In this case, this would be a cleansing purpose. This would have been smelly. Um, the way it's brought here in this passage of Scripture, if you look again uh, in verse number 37, is that she brings an alabaster box. An alabaster box would have been a box made of alabaster. Pretty simple. So not a lot of interpretation there. Alabaster is a white stone. I've been to places before that have a lot of alabaster cities that are considered white, except those white cities get very, very dirty, so they're kind of like off-white cities. But uh, they look more like a tan, I guess, after a while. But the point is that it's white boxes that that would have been enclosed to allow this, this perfume or the scented oil to be placed in there would have sealed it up in such a way it wouldn't leak out or lose its its aroma. And so anyways, what it describes in this passage of scripture, she brings this alabaster box of oil. She stands at his feet behind him. And so she comes down to where he's at. And, um, and it describes in verse 38 the manner in which she does so. Verse number 38, stood at his feet behind him weeping, weeping. Apparently the weeping is a real weeping, not just a tear in her eye apparently this is a sobbing type weeping where tears are running down her face how much are they running down her face what it describes here and began to wash his feet with tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment so literally she's washing his feet jesus is sitting there she bends down to to start washing his feet with the tears that have been pouring down no doubt accumulating as she has fearfully walked into the presence of our savior and as these tears are coming down dripping on his feet she's taking them wiping them down with the wet no doubt some with the wet hair that she's got there she's wiping off his dirty feet now their feet how many of you are kind of disgusted by feet all right now i'm telling you Jesus is a savior, but I guarantee his feet were nasty, okay? And this is not, this is not a slight against him, but he's walking around in this stuff, and so she's wiping nasty feet because she's walking around. If you see people that, like, walk around barefoot a lot, it changes things. My, my, my family, one of my, I think I'm pretty sure the reason my wife married me is because I had nice feet back then. Before I, before I married her, I married a girl from Tennessee, and we stopped wearing shoes and stuff. But... Um, we would. We, I, I never went barefoot ever growing up. This is completely an aside. But uh, we were. I was told that if you like went barefooted, you would get pneumonia. Uh, I was. I was That's what I was told. That's what my grandma told me. Also, the same thing. It's like you stand in front of the refrigerator too long, you'll get pneumonia. So we never did either one of those dangerous things until I got married. Um, I also could never have Jello before I ate dinner. I blew that myth out of the water as soon as, as soon as I could. Anyways, the the point is that um, it affects your feet to be out there barefooted or in sandals all the time, and she's cleansed it, they're dirty, and as she's cleansed it, now it's not just enough to clean it, because now what what happens when you clean something that like you kind of just expose dirty, sweaty feet, it's actually gonna smell more. And so they would put this ointment that was, and you know what I'm talking about, when when, uh, something, for instance, a gym bag's kind of left alone, it smells, but as soon as you open it all up, then it really smells. So imagine that with feet, so these dirty feet, have now been gotten, they've been wet. So the sand that's been drying them up, caked on them, they've been wet and they've been cleansed, but now the smells are starting to come out. And, and she pours this oil on his feet. It's incredibly expensive. Uh, other people that did this describes a great uh, deal, a great sum of money this would have represented, probably a whole year's worth of earnings for a normal person earning a daily wage, poured out for the feet of Jesus just to, to make sure that his feet are, are not, not smelly. They, they remain clean and disinfected. Uh, this also what is applied to his head, that is poured on his head, um, not for the sake of just putting it on him, but once again, a cleansing and a, a purifying agent there that was put on him. And this was a somewhat common custom, uh, so much so that Jesus is going to refer to this, but this is taking place by this woman who's sobbing. Now, I get uncomfortable when people really just let it go as far as crying. I do. I, I, and... and I've been at places where it's very appropriate where people are crying that much. 
but I still get uncomfortable. I, I remember I, um, I've ever had one di public display of where I have wept severely. That's when I resigned our last church. And I'll tell you, I, I, um, I didn't, didn't mean to. I'm like, I'm going to be strong. And I showed up there and I was strong. And I tried reading the resignation letter. I just bawled my eyes out. People are crying. People are like, I don't even know what you said, but we saw you crying. So we started crying. And so all the sympathetic criers, thank you. But it's enough where people get uncomfortable. And, and so this lady is bawling her eyes out at this very special dinner where Jesus is the guest of honor and this Pharisee has honored Jesus and what he's given and this woman shows up purely humble and is serving Jesus in the most humble way everything she's got so the question then is who is this it's a sinful one describes her in verse number 36 I'm sorry verse number 37 as a as a sinner now the way it says it is that she's a sinner but she's a sinner of that city the, the way it's written would be similar. When you see that kind of designation, it would seem that this would be one that we perhaps today would call a prostitute. Uh, this is consistent in the scripture. For instance, um, the woman Delilah that Samson loved was one also that of this type of profession, if you can call it that. Several occasions that they would be marked specifically to the city. And so she was a sinful person, an immoral woman, a sinner connected to this city. And well known for that purpose. As far as what she did, uh, she was known as being a sinful, vile, immoral person. And, and so with this, this one who really does not deserve to be before the Savior. And if you think about it, we preach this kind of thing, don't we? That for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Literally, you cannot make an approach before his glory because you've sinned. And yes, you are sinners. Whatever you came with, you came with sin. And this woman was known, not just in her private life, not with her personal struggles, but literally in a public setting, she was known to be wicked and sinful. Earlier on, we read back in Genesis number, uh, chapter 38, where um, Judah, one of the children of Jacob, had gone and solicited a harlot, and likewise with it, wanted her put to death. When he found out that it was his daughter-in-law that had played the harlot. And uh, anyways, why? Because it was considered as something immoral and ungodly, even back then, although, uh, although a popular profession by some of the things we see here. But this woman, who was a sinner, came with this access, knowing that she could, in fact, access the Savior. She wasn't going to access the Savior in a, in a sort, sort of pride or any sort of approach that she thought she deserved to be there. Instead, you see a humility about her. You'll notice that back in Matthew chapter number 11, the issue was that they did not repent. In this passage of scripture, it describes that she comes with humility. Now, th what, what I want you to catch on this, when we think about repentance, we shut down much of the, the way in which is used. Oftentimes, we add a lot of different things to it. But in its simplicity is this change of mind. But what we find is this, that repentance is going to come with a natural with a natural thing, and that's this thing called humility. What I mean by that, she comes not because she's just self-abased, not because she's, she's, um, she's weeping. In fact, my wife, I remember she, went, she wanted to get saved, and so she went forward during an altar call during a meeting. I don't remember if it was a, a revival meeting or something. But when she went forward to this, uh, to this meeting to get saved, the altar worker showed her how to get saved and uh, led her through a prayer. And then she said, you're not saved because you didn't cry. And by the way, that's a, that's a dangerous thing. So at what level uh, of, uh, of emotional breaking is appropriate there? Um, later on, and by the way, she didn't actually get saved during that time because she, she still had a lot of confusion about what salvation was. She did accept Christ later on. But now in this, there is a requirement of humility in repentance in the sense that what we are doing is that we are really subjecting our truth to the truth that is God's. Literally what you're saying is I am wrong and he is right. There is a humility in understanding that. Now the level to that humility doesn't mean that there's an emotional connection in that kind of thing that is going to manifest itself in some kind of tears. Some people do. Well, some people will have that. But the point on that is that we are subjecting ourselves. This change of mind is a humbling of our intellect to the pure and perfect inter in intellect and knowledge and, and truth of God. The reality that she's unworthy and she is wrong and God is right. The Bible describes this in multiple different ways. The point is that when this is described here is that she needs Jesus. She needs him. This is this truth that she has subjected herself to. There is a necessity of humility. Now, once again, humility is not necessarily seen in the way she was. Many of you probably, I'm not going to ask her to raise a hand. Most of us probably when we got saved did not weep a single tear. But at the same time, there was such that I am wrong. And he is right. I cannot save myself. 
the despair of I am lost and he is my only hope. I need to trust Jesus Christ is something that had to, that had to take place. Anybody who comes to Jesus thinking that they are somehow worthy to receive him is not saved. Now, here's what I mean by that. If you feel you're bringing anything of your own merit to salvation, you're not saved. Salvation has to come that it is Christ alone, sufficiently, entirely, of no merit of your own. Now, the question is the levels to that. Now, Jesus is going to answer this in a powerful way. Because some people, you have those stories where you have people like this who are sinners in this extreme way. You have sinners who have, uh, have, re have, have seen in their life the, just the despair and the wickedness that they have been in the depths of all sorts of mire of this world. And you have some that have been saved at a young age and have been raised in Christian homes, never having done many things, never having touched a, or tasted a single drop of alcohol or ever, ever gotten near or even touched a, a cigarette in their life or seen anything of immorality on the computer. There have been people saved that have had none of those things. And yet what you find with this is there seems to be a difference where people kind of hold up the testimony of the individual who, who has much to be forgiven of. And by the way, there's a reason for that. People tend to be excited a little bit more when they have been forgiven of much. But I would submit to you on that that much of it has to do with the fact that we oftentimes do not realize how much we have been forgiven of. Oftentimes for the sinner that doesn't realize how much they've been forgiven of, has not fully understood the, the depth of those individual sins that we've committed before the Lord. But it's enough to say that you're lost. Thankfully, children understand that when they disobey parents, that was bad. But as we get older, no doubt that we'll have those interactions, for instance, children that, that grow up and realize in guilt sometimes before their parents about how they had dishonored and how they had done wrong before their parents. And realizing finally, not, yes, I knew it was wrong then, but the depth of that finally grabbed me afterwards. It never changed the relationship with the parent but it has increased it, has grown it. But once again, the parent-child relationship was always together there. And so um, she was seriously low. She was seriously low. Um, she was humble. She was serious and, and brought this gift of great value. She had great hope where Jesus was her solution. didn't matter where he was. She was going to go to him. Uh, but I want you to look at the second person in this, and you have Simon. Now, with this, uh, Simon, in verse number uh, 39 it says, now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself, saying, this man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. Now, there's, a, um, th there's something that takes place here with Simon the Pharisee. Because uh, we know it's Simon because uh, Jesus is going to answer him. And by the way, you'll notice in verse number 39 that the Pharisee doesn't talk to Jesus. In fact, in verse number 39, um, he spake within himself. Now, I, I love this. Simon the Pharisee says to himself, he's sitting there, and just imagine the thought bubble popping up in his mind. If this was really Jesus, he would know. If this is really the Messiah, he would know who this woman is. Well, and Jesus reads his mind. I love it. So not only does he know who this woman is, he knows what Simon is thinking word for word. And so as he's sitting back, Jesus, I imagine, looks over to Simon, locks eyes with him, and says, Simon, i got to talk to you. Look at the next verse, verse number, um, verse number 40. And Jesus answered, he said it to him. Notice Simon didn't ask a question, but Jesus is going to respond to what he's thinking. Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. Hey, i, I got something to tell you. Right, that's how we would say it today. And he saith, Master, say on. And, and so Simon gives permission to Jesus to speak. Great, okay. And verse number 41. Uh, I, I, love, I would love for Jesus to have said, I don't need your permission. But anyways, but he did. Verse number 41. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, thou hast rightly judged. So he says, okay, Simon, I got to tell you something. All right, go ahead. There was a guy who was a creditor. He loaned out people money, and there was one who owed 500 pence. Now, pence, it, it's, a, it's, it's not a gigantic sum of money, but it was 500 pence would have been sufficient. That It's a lot. And, uh, and then there's another one that describes uh, uh, 50. So 50 pence, let's, let's say 50 bucks or fi 500 bucks. Okay? Now, that's not an accurate assessment. But let's just say 500 or 50. And he says to both of them, you're both forgiven. Let me ask you, are they entirely forgiven, the one of 50 or the one of 500? Yes, they are. They're entirely forgiven, completely forgiven. 
That's not the question. You see, he's thinking, well, this person, this person uh, who is standing there behind him, that, or he, she's very sinful. Simon, on the other hand, thinks, well, I'm not very sinful, and I have the audience of the Messiah. But in verse number, uh, verse number 43, Simon says, well, I just think, come on, the guy of, a guy of 500 is going to be more grateful on this one. And he says, yeah, you're right. It's verse number 44. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, seest this woman? I entered into thine house, thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she hath washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman since the time I came in hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. Now, I don't believe what he's trying to tell Simon is, listen, Simon, you've not sinned that much in your lifetime, so you don't get her. I think what he's demonstrated to Simon is he's telling Simon, you don't understand how much of a sinner you are. Because in this occasion, Simon is the one that is crippled by a few things. He's crippled by his view of, his view of Jesus. He has a preconceived notion of who Jesus is, that Jesus wouldn't have anything to do with this individual, and that religion should reach good people, not lost people. We have this idea that, uh, that this is what should take place. We have our most likely to succeed amongst Christians. We've said it. We've heard it. If that person gets saved, they could really do something for the Lord. Listen, can I tell you something? That's not a right, and that's not a right mentality to have about Christianity. When we think, well, that individual could, or that person won't contribute much. That person is not going to add much. Well, here's the deal. The best dressed, the most knowledgeable, most talented is not doing the most for God's kingdom. I can't tell you the number of individuals I've seen, even in college or in churches, that have the most likely to succeed for Jesus, the ones that would be pastoring those churches, and they never did. In fact, many of them are not even in church services today whatsoever because we have in our mind what would be successful. Ultimately, Jesus welcomes her to him. Jesus is the one that welcomes her. Jesus is the one that accepts her, but he is crippled by what, what view uh, of Jesus he had. He had a preconceived idea of what Jesus should be. He, he thought in his mind, well, if he was really the Savior, then, then this wouldn't be the, what he would do. Secondly, he's crippled by what he did not believe Jesus could do. He didn't think Jesus knew who she was. He also, I'm guessing, didn't think that Jesus could read. All right, you might be thinking a couple of different things, or at least you'd be trying. If you notice the guy you're sitting there at the table with is reading or is, is hearing everything that you're saying. So in those things, he's crippled by what uh, he thought Jesus should be, and he's crippled by what he did not believe Jesus could do. And Jesus was able to do it all. The, the point is that it's not suggesting that Simon wasn't that bad a sinner. But why, why do we know that? Because when you look at Paul's testimony, Paul describes himself as being the chief of sinners. And he was in this group called the Pharisees. So it's not a matter of like, oh, you're a Pharisee, so you're not that sinful. The reality is this woman who was a sinner acknowledged that she was a sinner. And she was more grateful, not because she had done more sin, but because she acknowledged that. Now, I'm speaking to you as by point of application. I'll be done with this here. It is not that you have to desire that your testimony be vast and great. Your simple acknowledgement has to be how bad your sin was. You're not grateful for the salvation that you've been given? Go back to what you were. Now, I'm not saying go and delve into those things. Not for this. In fact, some of us will do this as Christians. We'll go back to those things that we were before we were saved, or perhaps early on in Christianity, things we feel guilty for, and we'll just plunge into this despair. Like, I can't believe this. And we're so bothered by this. And instead, what that should do is it should drive you to the fact that Jesus saved you. And for this person, it was much that she would do anything, including the embarrassment of wiping the feet of an individual with the tears from her own eyes and her own hair. She would do this for Jesus because it didn't matter what everybody thought. There's a gratitude that would be there because a comprehension of our loss. I think Paul understood that. You realize that Paul, in his life, the way it describes in the scriptures, that he didn't even know he was a sinner, except for one thing. Does anybody remember what that was? He says covetousness which is idolatry. That's, that's, that's what made him realize, like, oh, wait, 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 I'm guilty. I, I do all these things. I don't do that. I don't do this. I got the Bible memorized, and I'm doing good. Until God revealed to him that you're covetous, and that covetousness is idolatry is what he says. And so 
it's not because, well, he had so many sins. By the way, that eventually poured out into more, like, you're killing Christians. Obviously, there's some really, really big things that he's doing. But this just simply unpacked those things. But it first started with something, faith in Christ. Faith in Christ. This is what it's driving to. This is what it's driving. It's not now because, oh, well, she has reformed in this gigantic way. No, she came to a realization that Christ, he is the Messiah. He's the one that needs to be sought. He's the one that can save. And notice what he ends with in this passage of Scripture. In verse number 47, wherefore I say unto thee, unto thee, Simon, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. In verse 48, and he said unto her, thy sins are forgiven. He tells her, thy sins are forgiven. By the way, did you notice in verse number 47, her sins are forgiven. Then he tells her, thy sins are forgiven. You catch what's going on? Her sins were already forgiven. Why? Why were her sins forgiven? Because she had already believed. She had already believed, and so her sins were already forgiven before she heard that verbal affirmation from God, from Jesus Christ telling her, your sins are forgiven. Why do we know that? Because verse 47, it says her sins are forgiven. Verse 48, he tells her that, and look at verse 49. And they sat at meat with him, um, and they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, who is this that forgiveth sins also? Uh, by the way, Jesus knows what he's saying there as well, because <laughs> he just listened to the other ones. Verse 50, and he said to the woman, thy faith has saved thee. Go in peace. I, I love this. Because in this, this guy says, wait a second, if, if this was really the Christ, he would send her away because he doesn't even know what a bad sinner is touching his feet and touching his hair. And so he says that this woman is grateful she's been forgiven much. And this woman, her sins are forgiven. Her sins are forgiven and many of them. And people are thinking, wait a second, who is this guy thinking that he can forgive sins? Thy sins are forgiven. Why are they sins forgiven? Uh, according to this one, thy faith has saved thee. Thy faith has saved thee. Hey, you believed. You believed. What's the faith? What's, it, because somehow he removed them in some way. It was received because he had, she had faith in Christ, the Messiah. And by the way, this faith came before Jesus Christ died. Because this wasn't a brand new way of salvation. It was faith. It was faith. She came to Christ as the, belief, as the one that he would, she would need to believe on. Powerful. Now, a couple points of application. Number one is this. You didn't save yourself. You didn't save yourself. This is a big thing. I, I think this is vital, in fact, because in this case, the Pharisee thinks, I don't have to be forgiven much. I mean, I, I'm pretty much there. I just, I just kind of need that nod from God. That he's, you know, he's, he's, he, I need the thumbs up from him, and, and I'm good. And we would say, well, that's wrong, except we act that way. Well, <laughs> I wasn't that bad. But when people come in... And, and they would be dressed in a way that we would disagree with, or they would, be, we would, they would be saying some things that we would disagree with. Here's the point. The salvation for that sinner and the ones that would not perceive ourselves as such a way as a sinner in that level, we're saved either from a 500 or from 50, but it's full forgiveness. The difference is the comprehension of the fact that we're lost. Praise God for the person that realizes that they're lost even a little bit. By the way, Paul realized his lostness with one sin. I, I really believe that after Paul got saved, he started to realize there was more sin. But it was enough that he was lost with one. It was broken. I, I'm a sinner because of one. This woman is just more relevant. It's more, more obvious. I'd imagine people tell her this. No doubt the Pharisees looked down on her. No doubt the Pharisees would not give her entrance. People wouldn't allow her in the synagogue because of how wicked she was. The, the Pharisees didn't want uh, Jesus even or her to touch the feet of Jesus, the, the dirtiest spot of Jesus. And yet, Jesus accepts her because she believed. And so anyways, my, here's my point. You didn't save yourself. If that means that, um, I'm sorry, what I'm saying, if you didn't save yourself, that means the per people that come are not saved by you or by their own merit either. There's no point in which there is a reformation of desire in which they have converted themselves enough. It is completely by Jesus not by works of righteousness, not by the intentions of righteousness. It's only by faith in Jesus Christ. He tells them, the, how did Jesus forgive this woman? He puts it out for everybody to hear. Thy faith has saved thee. That's saved by faith. Praise God. You didn't save yourself. Number two, your past is done. When you got saved by faith, your past is done. It's paid for. Now, I don't doubt that in this room we are, there's shame and things that we wouldn't want anybody to know about. There's things in my life I don't want anybody to know about. Sometimes I'll slip up and I'll say something, and, and I, there's, there's things that I'm, I'm ashamed for my children to know about me. I can say, well, it was before I was saved. Some things even while I was saved. Some things while I was pastor, things that I've said and done. 
And the reality is it's, it's covered by the blood. When I believed on Christ, when I had faith in him, not just an idea where I acknowledge he could, but literally trust him too, that it's done. It is done. Your past is done. For you, you're going to continue to discover. I've had times where I felt guilty and realized, and like, oh, I didn't even realize that bad until the Lord would reveal this to me more in Scripture. Your past is done when you got saved. Number three, you were saved from much. You were saved from much. Whenever we get to the point where we think, well, that sinner is really bad, I think the issue is that we don't realize how bad of sinners we were. Oh, the only thing I ever did was stole a cookie. I was deceitful. But we compare ourselves among ourselves, and God says that's not wise. Take that comparison of that cookie you stole. Maybe that was the one transgression you committed before holy God. As you stand at the, at the, temp, at the, at the uh, gates of the city one day, which is not going to happen this way, but if you stand before there and you're going to play back your sins, and there's that cookie event where you went in there and grabbed that, that cookie jar, and you opened it up, and you stole it, and that was all you've ever done there would still be the shame of knowing the fact that compares in no way to a holy and righteous God at all. That transgression which you have, you have been deceitful, you have dishonored your parents in doing so, you have dishonored authority in those things, even in that one. The reality here is that you have broken the law in all points. You're guilty of all. And we don't know how far that we have been forgiven. That's why in Ephesians, when he tells us to understand the, the de- width and breadth and depth of his love, boy, it's going to start unpacking some things for you. Boy, I, I, I'm going to be further driven into yes, this humility where everything that I think I'm holding on to for my benefit is wrong, and I need to give it to the Lord. I need, I need to give it to him. I need to rely on him. I need to continue to believe what he tells me about all the different matters that he continues to reveal in our hearts. So... You were saved from much. So again, you did not save yourself. Your past is done when you got saved by faith. No other way. And you were saved from much. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you, for, Father, for the passage of Scripture you gave us. Lord, thank you. Thank you so much just for the clarity in which you give this. Lord, I do not believe that um, this is a wasted time here when we simply emphasize the fact that our redemption was this powerful as it was for that woman. Lord, I believe that there are people that came to you in this room that came that that truly had this brokenness about them when they came and realizing that, that they were so lost they needed you. And I also believe that there are some people that perhaps convinced of their sin and in, in, in perhaps they were the 50 pence believers that realized that they needed that 50 pence paid for, but it's still forgiven, God. And Lord, as we realize this, the depth in which we were saved, God, I pray that, that would drive us to that, that, uh, that further relationship with you, that the fullness of you would be known greater because of the great love in which you've loved us. Lord, we love you. We thank you so much for what you provided. Give us wisdom, Lord, as we just rejoice in you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right.